all very much. Uh, it was a kind introduction. Um, the last time I was at Villanova was about 50 years ago when my Quaker meeting took us young friends to see other religions and for the first time I set foot in a Catholic church which was here on your campus. And I don't know whether you guys know it, How many has anyone been in a Quaker meeting? Up in the front, but at the back, um, Quaker meetings, unlike your churches, have no stained glass, no statues, no paintings, no altar, no cross, no priest, no wine, and no wafers. Some, some say we're just too cheap, but there is a religious reason why on simplicity. But needless to say, our eyes nearly fell out of our faces when we walked into your beautiful St. Thomas's Church. So it's nice to be back, uh, even if we're not over there. Um, I did a little research in advance to find out what I was getting into, and I don't know what you guys think you're into, but according to your Arts and Sciences website, I am addressing a very impressive group. It describes you, art and science students, as, and I quote, intellectually inspired, morally grounded, globally minded, world changers. There you are. <laughs> you are a tad intimidating to me, so you'll have to keep uh, cut me a break, because when I went off to college, way back in the last millennium, it was so long ago, colleges didn't have websites. Nobody had websites. We didn't even have the internet. But then again, we didn't have seat belts, luggage with rollers, or Starbucks. So way back then, colleges only had mottos. Yours, of course, is veritas, unitas, caritas, truth, unity, and charity, as I'm sure you all know. But now, more important, colleges have to have catchy, inspirational slogans. Yours, in case you don't know, is Ignite Change. I understand what it's trying to say, but have to point out that Cesar Sayoc, the man who mailed 13 bombs to Democrats two weeks ago, was also hoping to ignite change. But fortunately, he seems to have flunked Bomb Making 101 However, Ignite Change is better than some of the others I've heard, particularly one from another local university, which was, it's all about you. <laughs> well, no, it's not all about you. If it was only all about you, all you'd need is a mirror. <laughs> but, um, you're here to uh, learn about a few other things. And I, I digress on that. That was some totally unimportant because some of you English majors may end up, again, according to your website, in marketing and advertising. It will be your job to make sure the copy you come up with can't be picked apart and lampooned by cartoonists. So be careful what you write. When I, gra um, when I graduated, I, too, had the all-important BA in English. And, of course, I had no idea what I was going to do with it. I graduated into a recession. Or almost everybody claims they do that. And when I got out of school, I had to piece together um, a lot of jobs. And fortunately, at the time, journalism was available for English majors with no particular career, career abilities. So one of, the, one of the many odd jobs I took was as a stringer for the Westchester Daily Local News. And I covered township supervisor meetings, um, school board meetings, and the like. Um, I 
uh, I reported on huge stories like the time that the Pocops and Township supervisors lowered the blade on their road, on their, uh, road mowers from 18 to 15 inches. Mm -hmm. That was my big story. And, but that is where I learned a little bit about the, bl the building blocks of democracy because everybody there was, uh, many of the people there had been elected to their positions and they were trying to do something for their community. Um, I had never taken formal art classes up until then, but I'd o always doodled and I started doodling on the edges of my reporting. Um, and the newspaper, being um, a freewheeling place, started using the doodles as well as my, um, as my reports. And it occurred to me that cartooning combined my interest in art, my interest in politics, and um, my total lack of interest in spelling. So cartooning became uh, what I thought I would want to do in life. Um, there were other details along the way, or other detours along the way, including one to, um, well, I have to tell you, first of all, um, the salary for freelancing, uh, cartooning, or not cartooning, uh, for reporting at the time was $10 a story. So it was not exactly a lucrative p profession. Although, I don't know, do any of you know the writer Dave Barry? Front rows doesn't, the back people don't, because he was really, really popular in the 1990s. He was a humor writer. He's really hysterical. Um, he was my editor before he became a, a, a world famous um, uh, writer. Any rate, he sort of helped us out with creative writing on our expense accounts, so that helped us helped us make up the um, low the low part of the uh, salary. Uh, but I was offered a place at, at uh, Haverford Professor's project to go uh, to the island of Cyprus to bring peace to Greeks and Turks. I don't know if anyone has studied Greek-Turkish history, but that is a fool's errand. <laughs> it's been the two uh, groups have been at each other for, for um, hundreds and hundreds of years. And so uh, we arrived to make peace. And um, nine months later, war broke out. Uh, there was a coup d'etat in, uh, in Cyprus, and then in, on the Greek side, it was majority Greek, and then the Turks invaded the island, which was just a very short uh, sea distance away in the Mediterranean. Um, I, I was there by myself at that time, and um, was feeling a little isolated because it was really, bombs really were dropping and people were really being killed. Um, so I, I, I went in one, one day to the capital, Nicosia, and the only hotel was op that was opened had all the journalists who had suddenly flown in from war, war uh, sites all over the world to come because, well, bombs fall, journalists come. At any rate, I went down to the, the pool one the night I was there, and all these guys were, they were all men, were hanging around the pool, and they were talking about uh, how they like to uh, go scuba diving in the Red Sea, and how their vacation house up in northern Cyprus had been overrun, and uh, what the last war was that they were coming from. And they were just talking about it like, you were talking about soccer matches. I thought, God, these people are so callous and hard and um, sort of self-involved. But I also thought, I've found my people. <laughs> because in addition to being um, sort of monomaniacal about what they were doing and sounding a little superficial. They were also super dedicated and brave. They are the people who go out, there are eyes and ears on the rest of the world. Um, and uh, one, one of the men I met that night was killed the next day in, in a, a road ambush in northern Cyprus, which was a battle in a war no one even remembers takes place, took place. Um, and I'd just like to remind audiences that, that 
they are the mainstream media, um, and they are serving uh, a purpose in the world to try to try to um, keep us abreast of what's going on in places we'd otherwise never hear about. At any rate, when I got back, I moved into the city and um, into Philadelphia and started taking remedial art courses and also um, uh, to earn my living, worked at the, uh, I took the art courses at the Academy of Natural, or the Academy of Fine Arts, and then I worked at the Academy of Natural Sciences. And I never had much of a science background, but working there, I learned a lot about from the scientists who, again, these people go out into the field and they test the water, they count birds, they look at fossils. Um, they were fantastically interesting, and they, uh, they taught me a lot. Um, and so my education actually has come from sort of accidental sources. It wasn't all in a university classroom. Um, and by the way, my university was way out west. I was a um, geographic affirmative action candidate because they needed people from the east coast to round out their um, student body. But I really recommend to you all, I mean, if you have a chance to go uh, on a junior year, think about going to Alabama or Iowa or Idaho. Um, our country is so huge and so different in all of its places, and we are so parochial uh, when we live, uh, well, I had been anyway, I won't speak for all of you, but I had never been out of this area. And it, just going to college, the best part of it for me was learning about the West and experiencing big open vistas and people with a totally different attitude. And going to Cyprus, I never would have gone to Cyprus. I would never even knew it was there before I got there. And uh, going, working at the Academy of Natural Sciences opened my eyes for that. So I just recommend that if you have a chance to explore things in different areas and go different places while you're learning, take, take those opportunities. They're really invaluable, and they stick with you forever. Um, I started uh, I started freelancing cartoons as I was going to school, and again, five dollars a cartoon, ten dollars a cartoon, racking in the big box as usual. But um, I put together a portfolio and started applying to newspapers, and um, there um, there was a job there. I got turned down for several, but finally I got a job in San Jose, California. Have any of you visited there? Some some people. Well, at the time it was the 1980s, and Apple was just getting started. And it was a tiny little town, really, um, south of San Francisco. But that's, uh, Steve Jobs was like a neighbor. And uh, people, all these people were just getting started in these wild companies. Hewlett Packard was a big deal. And they'd started something in their garage in the Silicon Valley. So again, I had, um, it was really a privilege to be there then. I didn't even know really what, ha what they were doing it, because <laughs> it started to explode after I left. But I had a fairly good sense, and again, of the kind of people who went there. There were a lot of Philadelphians who didn't have opportunity in Philadelphia. And they were the smartest kids from all, from Philadelphia and from all over the rest of the country went out there and built what we have today. Um, also, their government was totally different than ours. San Jose had a weak mayor government, which means that they had a city council, they had a mayor, but they didn't actually do much. They had a city manager who, actually, who did the day in and day out business. Well, about three or four years later, I got an offer to come back to Philadelphia, and for family reasons, thought that would be a good idea. But I get back to Philadelphia, there's a city council and a strong mayor, and they're having fistfights on city, uh, in city hall. I mean, it was like a totally different thing. And, you know, and 
San Jose was booming and Philadelphia was rotting at the time. It was full of, uh, it was uh, the beginning of the crack epidemic, it was um, dirty, people were leaving, they all wanted to come to Villanova, <laughs> so maybe your parents were some of those um, uh, refugees. But um, it was a great place to be a cartoonist because there were so many terrific characters to uh, draw about and uh, so many problems to, to tackle, and you can do that through cartooning. So, um, at any rate, that's how I got where I am today. Um, but just for my own curiosity, how many of you read newspapers? And really, on paper? Not on, on paper, hands up? So, this is what you see when you open a newspaper's editorial page. It's like this. And the cartoon is always there in the same spot. And when you get to that page, you see the cartoon whether you like it or not. On a website, it's floating around somewhere, and it is, it's not anchored in the same way. So um, how many of you even find political cartoons? Do, do you, how many of you look at political cartoons? A few. Well, it used to be, used to be not that many years ago that this was a really common way of, uh, of political commentary being, um, being distributed. There were editorials, there were op-eds, there, um, there were cartoons. And uh, we've sort of been replaced by memes. <laughs> you know, people uh, s send around quick, quick re reactions with memes on the internet, and that kind of serves as editorial cartoons. Also, the evening um, comedy shows, uh, uh, Saturday Night Live, Colbert, the rest of them are, they are so current, and they talk about the things that we draw about that they've, um, that, you know, we don't have the same, um, same lock on the uh, comedy corner. However, we do uh, keep at it, and uh, people who like editorial cartoons like them a lot. Um, and as a cartoonist, you, we can really, really tackle the big issues. We can tackle politics, poverty, you know, racism. And so I'll start with, <laughs> the, my cartoon when you guys won the uh, the uh, championship of the game, the game, and I appreciate that because it really it's so nice to have something that is not politics. I will. Um, I'm going to from here uh, do a slideshow that's going to um, awkwardly combine three different things, and I don't know if it'll actually fit together, but. One is a, um, will be political cartoons, straight up political cartoons, mostly on Donald Trump because he's, he's it. Uh, some on the history of cartooning and um, uh, lastly on free speech. Uh, because no matter what part of <coughs> the arts and sciences you're in, I just, if you, don't remember anything else, just remember that we are all so goddamn lucky to have the First Amendment, because it's, um, we can't, we, we would be a completely different country without it. Any rate, um, so I'll be doing hard-hitting uh, uh, cartoons about, about politics, of course, That's when the two of them got together. But I, first I want to just go, uh, take a detour to uh, about um, the history of cartooning because the first person to figure out how to mass market cartoons was an Augustinian monk. Anyone, under, anyone have a guess who that might have been? A hint 500 years ago. Huh? Martin Luther. Uh, bad, bad um, image here, but uh, right now it's 501 years bef uh, since he nailed the theses on the door of Wittenberg Castle, and 
uh, started the, what would become the Protestant Revol uh, Reformation. Um, he was a monk, a devout, really super devout monk. And he, he started writing uh, his tracts attacking the Pope and particularly the practices of the Catholic Church, which he saw around him in Germany. Um, but he, and he was using the new social media of the time, which was the printing press. Uh, he would write his stuff in, in um, Latin, but he'd also write it in German so that the people in his area could understand it. But most Germans didn't read at the time. This is 500 years ago. So he also started um, commissioning woodcuts to go with them. And these woodcuts are um, essentially uh, polemical drawings arguing for his case and attacking uh, the Roman church uh, for its excesses. This is one of them that would never appear in our newspapers today. Uh, on the left, you have some uh, Lutheran sym sympathizers uh, aiming their bare bottoms towards the pope and uh, letting go gas uh, in the direction of a papal bull, which he wrote and, uh, the, and Luther did not agree with. But this is, all, this is mild compared to some of the other ones. This is um, a picture of um, four figures being hanged from a gallows. The pope is on the left and three cardinals on the right. And their tongues are nailed to the gallows next to them, too, so they could not speak anymore. Um, these guys were serious. Um, and You'll be happy to know the Catholics didn't take this sitting down. They had their, they turned to their own cartoonists. And this is one about Luther on the seven heads are his descent from sanity to insanity. And one of them has bees buzzing around his, um, his vacant uh, noggin. And this one, you can't really see it, but this is his, the Lutheran tree which is essentially dead. There are all, all dead leaves, there are skeletons, there are witches, there are um, poisonous snakes and animals underneath, uh, obviously saying that Lutheran, this is what Lutheranism would bring. Uh, this one was used by both sides. It's uh, the devil playing the monk. Uh, uh, play, you know, using the monk to um, to distribute his uh, evil message. It's often attributed to um, the saying that the Catholics were using this and the monk's head was Luther's, but the, um, the scholars I've talked to say no, in most of them are the other way around, um, that this is just a, um, a common haircut for monks of the time. And uh, so they, it would have been using Catholic monks. But either way, um, you get the point. They were not subtle. Uh, fast forward. Oh, by the way, after uh, it, it, Luther lived till the uh, mid-1550s, and after, uh, and from that time on, Europe was just, it broke Europe into war for hundreds, well, not hundreds, but uh, many decades. Uh, at, they estimate that six million Germans were killed uh, during the fighting, which is more than uh, all of the, uh, the fatalities in, in World War II. So um, this fight had real consequences for real people. But I uh, get up to the, 17, or the 1850s in the United States, and this is Thomas Nast, and this is um, a famous, iconic image from American history of uh, Nast went over the rich plutocrats in, in New York, uh, and this is how he portrayed them. And cartoonists everywhere are so jealous. I mean, look at that guy, and look at how he dresses. I mean, he's great to draw and great to make fun of. And now our billionaires shop for t-shirts at Gap, and it's very demoralizing for cartoonists. We're not amused. Nast was worked out in New York. 
he uh, was a staunch unionist. He opposed the um, the civil war, or the the secession of the southern states, and was called uh, by some the best recruiter for the union cause. Um, he also championed Lincoln, and this is what he drew for the Emancipation Proclamation. But I include a the next slide. Um, because it's about uh, immigration. He was very suspicious about immigration to the United States, particularly from Southern European Catholic countries, because he, having, he was a German, he had come from Germany, and with the background uh, that we described earlier, uh, real, it did not want to see uh, Rome taking over the United States. So he did this very famous cartoon, extremely vicious, with the uh, priests and the bishops coming out of the sea to the shores of America, and their mitres are the crocodile uh, teeth. And behind him is his arch, is Nast's arch enemy, uh, Boss Tweed, who was the head of the uh, of the New York uh, Democratic Party at the time, um, and. At any rate, this was uh, this uh, this wasn't his main theme, but this um, this cartoon I don't think would run in an American newspaper today. Um, Nast got his though uh, in the early two th uh, about ten years ago. The state of New Jersey went to name Nast as one of its honored sons. And there was such an uproar among New Jersey Catholics that that was nixed. No honorable son, um, Nast. A little bit farther along in the in early um, 1900s, a uh, Pennsylvania governor, Mr. Pennypacker, tried to write a bill uh, or, uh, that uh, would outlaw cartooning. And that was because a cartoonist had um, cartooned him as a parrot uh, and not in a very flattering way. So um, the other paper, the papers really went after him. And this is a cartoon showing him as a beer stein, a turnip, uh, 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 various other, oh, a tree, a dead tree. And um, the, 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 um, bill was withdrawn. Um, I used this freedom, though, uh, in a cartoon in the, about, around 1990 when the state legislature of Pennsylvania declared that the fungus was going to be our state vegetable. Um, after a while, someone pointed out that the fungus is not a vegetable. <laughs> and so I did this, the Pennsylvania State Legislature with the fungus, the state vegetable, the state fossil, et cetera, et cetera. And the guy who was uh, the Speaker of the House at the time uh, drew up a phony proclamation and named me the state vegetable substitute. So just so you know who you're looking at. Um, and then fast forward to another turn of, in our history. This was a um, parody uh, sort of cartoon advertisement in Hustler magazine. And it essentially says that Jerry Falwell had sex with his mother in an outhouse. Jerry Falwell was like the big uh, evangelical preacher of the time and very, very political in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, this is Falwell su sued Larry Flint, and uh, Flint lost on all the lower courts. It went to the Supreme Court, where um, Judge Rehnquist was uh, the head, and he was very conservative. Scalia was on the court. He was very con conservative. No one thought that Flint had a chance and he won a unanimous decision that essentially said, a cartoon is a cartoon, get over it. Um, so w as a, uh, a strong feminist, it hurts me to say that Larry Flint is one, at, who's one of the most disgusting pornographers in the country, is one of my heroes. At least he, he helped me out, and all my kind. 
Um, and this is, uh, this is where, th this is a cartoon I did about religion. It was in the 90s when the church, among others, was um, looking to get uh, tax credits for Catholic education and meanwhile um, being against, uh, trying to abolish abortion. Yes, I'm for choice in education. I am for the state giving your tax money to parents to give to me so I can teach their kids to be against choice in abortion. This cartoon got me into very, very, very hot water. It was in uh, 90, I have the date on there, I think 91. And um, the, the church in Philadelphia, this was still in a very uh, different time, was really dominant uh, uh, political force. And my paper heard about it big time. Um, but the reason I did it was not that I hate Catholics by any means or wanted them, you know, wanted to banish them back to Southern Europe, but that, um, that if somebody from any religion or any outfit comes to the government and asks for money and special favors, they have to be treated just as you treat any other supplicant. It, you can't have you say, I'm better than everybody else who is asking you for favors. And you'll be happy to know that not only uh, were Catholics mad at me, but for many other reasons. <laughs> Jews didn't like cartoons I did, and um, Muslims didn't either. So I, tr uh, I try to apply the, sta the same standard across the board. For example, this is Radical Islam Sponsors the Miss Muslim World Contest. Miss illiteracy, Miss can't vote, Miss waiting to be stoned. Um, a lot of uh, Muslim readers thought that it was very anti-Islam and we got uh, pickets and protests. Um, but again, it, um, there had been a stoning um, just the week before this cartoon appeared. Um, it's still true women can't vote in some countries and that it's a big deal in Afghanistan, for example, to even educate a girl. So I stand by the cartoon and I put radical Islam in there, understanding that there are many kinds of Islam and I was not trying to malign the whole religion. But again, if a religion starts usurping privileges of uh, people, which should be universal privileges wherever they are, I feel like that's a good place to stand up and make a, make a stink. Um, but I can do nice things about religion, too. Now, does anybody remember 2015, what was happening in the fall of 2015, an event other than the start of the elections, the, of the 2020 or the 2016 elections? Anyone remember a visit by a certain pope to Philadelphia? <laughs> well, this, uh, the first debate was uh, on, and I have to tell you, you have to look at this from a cartoonist point of view. I have a daily deadline. One, two, three, four, five, six caricatures to do in one day. I'm very proud of this, so I'm going to brag on it. And um, here's... Debate participants will be chosen by their poll numbers. And he was the most, uh, most, uh, uh, most popular of any of them at the time. Uh, oh well, <laughs> unfortunately in the primaries you learn how to draw all these guys and then they're out, <laughs> you know, five minutes later. Um, so then of course we, um, <laughs> We uh, come into the Trump era. Siri, can you please explain Donald Trump? <laughs> That's sort of how it felt like trying to figure him out, and it still feels like that. Uh, this was my first cartoon about him, Donald Trump at the border, um, and yeah. basically it was just about his hair, uh, which I always have appreciated. Um, this is how, this was how I started uh, in the new era, learning how to draw things. Uh, this was from one of his debates, and I, I don't have time to put them all up there, but I did caricatures of all the candidates. And what I do is, um, you know, I have these notebooks, and I just draw, and then um, when 
I get something I like, um, I'll tweet it out. And so I drew that during one of the debates, and uh, it was tweeted out the same night. And that's how fast uh, journalism has uh, changed. And that never, never even looked, uh, got into the newspaper. I have, uh, like, this one, uh, I'll just pass it around. You can look at the notebook. This one was about Khashoggi. Um, when, I, when that story broke, again, I didn't have time to do it for the newspaper, but I did a sketch and took an iPhone shot of it and sent it out. Um, it's both good and bad because you can send out things, as you all know, that you regret later. Uh, during the, cam the campaign, the other thing I did is I went out on the street to interview people about what they really thought. This was uh, uh, right before the Democratic, or during the Democratic National Convention here in Philadelphia. This guy was just a, a window installer in my neighborhood. And he was like an independent guy. He goes, I'm socially liberal, but you know, you'd, we've got too many regulations. The taxes are killing me. Uh, and it was clear to me that he was not going to be voting for Hillary Clinton. And that's when I sort of got, an, got a suspicion that we might, um, there might be more to the uh, Trump wave than we thought. But again, in journalism, what you need to do all the time is be out there looking. That's what artists do. They look and they see how people change. They see how, what they wear. They see what kind of sunglasses they wear. They see what their haircuts are um, and their beards, how long their beards are. Um, so that's what, that's what um, uh, artists of all kind, but particularly cartoonists, do. This was uh, the day after the election, backed by populist demand, The Apprentice. And this is the cartoon I would have drawn had Hillary won, but it is sitting in a closet and will never see the light of day. Um, then uh, him after Virginia, linking arms. Uh, the big parade, the Bone Spur Deferment Battalion. And um, this is uh, the GOP health care plan. Trump got everybody in a room, and they were all white men. There's nothing the matter with white men. I'm married to one of them, and I love them to death. But um, not to have women in the room at all uh, of any color uh, just um, frosted me. And uh, this held over to Kavanaugh. Is abortion legal in the case of drunk prep school boys? Um, and that girl is going to be uh, about 60 years old before Kavanaugh gets off the bench. I mean, he's going to be there for a long, long time. Uh, here's uh, Im Immigrant Kids. And uh, this one was after the synagogue shooting. Ban assault rifles, but we need them for hunting. School kids, wrong religion, concert goers, co-workers. I've done uh, hu uh, literally hundreds of cartoons about guns. Guns will not go away because of cartoons. I don't know what will uh, stem the carnage. But it really frosts me that they say, oh, just put another guard in front of the door. Well, there was a yoga studio shooting the other day. Does, do yoga studios need armed guards? I mean, how do you do yoga with your sidearm on? I just, I think we have gone, uh, gone crazy. And I really feel sorry for your generation because the other thing it's, it's done is, is increase surveillance and uh, thumbprints and background checks. Everybody's guilty uh, until proven innocent. And um, I, 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 I feel like America, the whole spirit of America being free um, is changing because of it. Um, then, um, so I've had, I've ha been able to do cartoons like this, and even though in the NRA complains, I get to do them. But in other countries, um, people are not given that freedom. And when, 
you guys were probably like five years old or so. There was a big, does anybody remember the Danish cartoon controversy? You guys were young when it happened, but a Danish uh, newspaper published these cartoons and they were draw Muhammad, and so a, ser a number of cartoonists drew different views of what Muhammad was, and it was re in response to uh, both killings, uh, but also censorship in Europe, and people were getting tired of being told what they could say or not say about Islam. Um, uh, <laughs> this guy's saying, chop, chop, we ran out of virgins. Because uh, they they said that if you were a suicide bomber, you'd get you know 72 virgins in heaven, and uh, this one is the most famous one. The simplest one is just uh, the head with the bomb, and uh, when they came out, um, there were riots in uh, all over the. They were. It took a while. A couple of people ginned it up, but there were riots, and in Pakistan, over 100 people were killed. Uh, protesting the fact that Denmark, all the way around the globe, had published these cartoons. And American newspapers mostly refused to, to print, reprint the cartoons because they were afraid of reprisals. I'm really glad to say the Philadelphia Inquirer did print this one. And they said, it's not because we hate Islam, it's because we think you should see what the complaint is about. And uh, one group shouldn't be able to say what another can and cannot look at. Um, there, were, there were protests in front of the inquiry. Lots of people came and protested and complained. But what it did, and what I want to stress about cartoons, is that it started a dialogue. And Philadelphia has become a, uh, has a great interfaith dialogue going between, uh, among Catholics and Jews and uh, Muslims and Protestants, uh, trying to find uh, c common ground so that we could live together. But um, one group can't tell another what, what it can publish and say. I tested that out uh, in this cartoon, which has uh, uh, Muhammad third from the right, uh, reading the big fat book of offensive religious cartoons. And this cartoon, even though at the time people were scared to death about putting uh, Muhammad in the newspaper, because he's laughing and happy with all the rest of the prophets and uh, religious figures, there were no complaints. And every time there's a murder of a cartoonist, this cartoon goes around on the internet a lot, and I've never ever had um, any peep uh, uh, of protest. Um, and this is a uh, this one uh, just to go through all the religions. This one, this one I, it's just a tiny little um, uh, illustration. It was only like that big, but Jews protested and said that I could not use the Star of David, even though it was about um, Earl Inspector, the senator at the time, uh, accusing Lynn Yackel of being anti-Semitic. It was just a totally bogus um, uh, accusation. But he was trying to reinforce his base and chip away at hers, and she narrowly lost. Um, <clears throat> but it was like the same thing as the uh, Muslims were saying. Muslims said, "You can't do our, you can't draw our holy figure." Um, Jews were saying, "This is a holy symbol. You can't use it." Well, in the same way as they, as long as it was positive, no one cared. Two months before this little drawing, I had drawn this about Palestinians aiming at Israelis, and there was not a peep. Nobody complained because it was pro-Israeli. And um, the stakes are really high to keep our freedoms. This is a cartoonist, Ali Ferzat, from Syria. Uh, he was taken out by the, the Syrian government to uh, a countryside, and just to be symbolic about it, they stomped his hands until they were broken. Um, but what everyone needs to know is you can't keep a cartoonist down. This was his retort. <laughs> so, um, 
stay free, keep your, there are no safe spaces. And uh, on, this is on the university the, of ideas I agree with and tweets I agree with, websites I agree with, publications I agree with. We're just preparing students for the real world. Well, we don't want that world. We want a world where everything can be available and we can take it if somebody insults us. I, I, it's, it's not that bad, I've lived through I've lived through bad stuff, and you can get to the other side. Similarly, the school safe space, absolutely nothing to offend anyone. And uh, this is the final one. Um, it's uh, Joseph Kepler from, I think, like 1880-ish in Vanity Fair magazine. Um, and he's making fun of every single religion in America, from Jews to Catholics to Baptists to Mormons. There's an Episcopalian, the Presbyterian, oh, this is the Presbyterian little doll. And uh, this is the New Age guru of the time, Henry Beecher Stowe, who uh, was uh, the, uh, preached the road to heaven is love. And uh, Puck is sort of the all-American figure and he says the best root is a, are clean hands and a pure heart. Um, that's what makes a religious person. So I uh, will finish with another hard-hitting topical cartoon for tomorrow's paper. <laughs> First-time voters need an ID. <laughs> so there you have it, My, everything I know. And now it's time for your questions, which I hope you have some. Anybody? Well, I saw the... Oh. No, go ahead. No, no, no. no, no, no. I'll go after you. Go ahead. No. Good. <laughs> Fight it out. <laughs> uh, I forgot what I was going to say. No. Um, yeah, so you're not always in the paper every day. How is it determined? Who gets in? Or is it like, or do you have set days that you... Why is this here? Anybody... <laughs> <laughs> just, just asking. <laughs> anyway, um, no, I used to be in six days a week. And uh, then about three years ago, I took a buyout for family reasons. And now I do four cartoons a week. And I'm usually in Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. But like tomorrow, I'm that, that gritty cartoon, that nitty gritty cartoon is going to be in because, well, it's election day and we want people to go out and vote. So um, that's, it's, it's a little odd, but that's just the way it is. And then they have syndicated cartoons in other days. What did you want? No, I, just, I, I, I saw that we need assault weapons mm -hmm. when it appeared about a week ago. I think. Mm -hmm. and it was tremendously powerful. I, um, I have the same perplexity why we can't study gun violence, why we can't speak of it. And I, I guess the, the lament is that before the cartoon that, that would have a tremendous audience, and now the, the audience is... Well, it, that's more very true. Much more self-selecting. Very true. Yeah, I tweet out my cartoons and I put them on Facebook and I have an Instagram, uh, which I hope you will all uh, sign up to. Um, but um, you're you're right. The people who sign up for me like some cartoon already, and then they sign up. Uh, I try to sign up for people I don't like and don't agree with, so that I can find out what's going on on the other side. And for example, I actually believe that they shut down that site, uh, Gab, uh, after the synagogue, or uh, after, either after the synagogue or after the bombing. And um, I thought, well, why shut it down? Everybody should just go on and send them little love letters. <laughs> you know, life is good. Why are you so upset? And, um, and counter some of the stuff that's on there. I mean, that's 
it, they they put they'll put anything up so let's you know we can do it that way too they'll find some other corner dark and spooky to um, put their um, their vile opinion in my feeling vile opinions but I think part of the reason that people go like these the guy at the synagogue and the the bomber they seem so isolated from the world they feel like everybody hates them well, a good way to reinforce that is to say, oh, you're not allowed to speak. So, at any rate. And some students, do you mind, who would get in the back, you and you? Yeah. Um, have you ever faced an editor who pushed back on any of the topics you wanted to cover in your cartoons or in any way limited the scope of what was successful for you to be drawn? Um, I spent most of my years at the Daily News. I'm in the Inquirer and Daily News now. But the Daily News was a very free, is a very freewheeling paper. And so I honestly had no trouble. Uh, although, I mean, like after that little tiny drawing of the Jewish star, the Star of David, I was in hot water. I mean, people came in and asked, to, said that I should be fired. But they stood by me. Uh, I didn't throw Stars of David around very casually after that, I must admit. But at any rate, um, uh, the one time that I was slowed down was after the Muhammad cartoons, and I paused before doing I really had to think about how to do the big fat book of uh, offensive cartoons um, so that it would say something other than, oh, it's bad to kill people, you know. Uh, and then I got to the Inquirer, and one cartoon was killed. And that was about the um, uh, the wall that fell down on the uh, Ar Salvation Army, and a young woman was killed, and a number of other people were killed. Um, and um, it was essentially saying that the the contractor uh, is in jail, an L&I inspector committed suicide after it, and the guy who owned it was getting off scot-free. He was sitting in his uh, penthouse apartment counting his money. And the Inquirer didn't want to run it, but the Daily News did, so it did get out. You have one? Um, I've been social media being such like, a huge public platform. Do you see like a big difference between your sponsored readers um, versus like print versus online? And That's a good question. Um, I uh, I think it's great to be in conversation with readers, but our readers used to um, write letters, and they'd go back and forth for a long time on the on the uh, letters page. Uh, like there was one uh, I did about gun violence in Philadelphia, and I used a Ku Klux Klan imagery. And that really set people off. Um, they, uh, the people in the black community, really went after me uh, because it was saying essentially, you know, they black young black men. Some, uh, this is not my. I don't blame everything on this. In this particular instance, it was something about, you know, lamenting the fact that so many young black men were dying, and it might as well be the Ku Klux Klan. Um, at any rate, um, I, it just set off a furor, and but it went. It started going back and forth between readers over time. They started. The first group said it was outrageous and should never have been published, and the second group said, "Well, I'm a black male, and that's how it is in my neighborhood, and it's not. That's not that crazy." And then. Other people would come back like that. And again, sort of like the Muslims, it's a way of starting a conversation. Um, and it evolves over time, whereas um, the reactions to tweets are like, like that. And it's, it's harder to go back and forth. Although I do have a spot on, uh, there's a, a site called Go Comics that has lots of different editorial cartoonists. And they have a, a a really easy comment section underneath, and so I go in and and reply to comments regularly. Not every one, but one or two that I think are really good, and try to keep a, a conversation up on that, or explain something if somebody's confused or whatnot. But it is it is different, and things just go so much 
faster, and not everyone sees the same thing. And as somebody said earlier, it, it, you tend to get self-selecting audiences. How, what do you think? Um, I think that people do choose to follow certain people, and that I think you can choose your point of views. Um, I grew up in a small town in Florida that was very, very, very Republican, and then moving up here was very different. Um, and I think it depends on who you surround yourself with, and I think you need to be able to see both sides of the field to choose properly. So you did what I was suggesting earlier, is go someplace else for college. <laughs> my, my daughter uh, went to Texas for college, and um, I remember her calling one night and saying that she'd been at an event where a bunch of NASA people, it was in Houston, and NASA is right nearby, and had been at this this talk or whatever, and she had sat down next to a former astronaut, military guy, and they got talking. My daughter's a real blabbermouth, and uh, he's starting to talk about his politics. And she said, oh, well, I believe, and started talking her little liberal uh, line. And she said, he turns it to her and goes, who raised you? <laughs> that would be me. Um, but at any rate, she survived, and she's, you know, she knows how to talk to people now be, and not be afraid that just because they're bigger and more important that they can't have a conversation. And that's, I, I really think, is what your generation is going to have to repair from the one, the generation that we're leaving you. Any, yep. The, the, the point that you made a moment ago about the conversations um, on the on the comment trail, I I do. There are a couple of uh, political cartoonists whom I like to see. Mm -hmm. One for very sentimental reasons. Tom Tolles was. Uh, I, I was a young professor at Buffalo, and he was an undergraduate there. Oh, he's great. He's at the Washington Post now. You shouldn't be sentimental. He's doing them every day. He's a genius. Yeah. I mean, he's really good. Um, but the thing that's really disheartening to me, and it, it, it's the contrast between what, what you um, indicated about the conversations that took place on the letter to editor's page mm -hmm. of newspapers. This takes place over uh, with a rhythm that's very big. It takes place over time, um, measured in days, weeks. It gives people a chance to think about what's been said and frame a response. And the thing that I see that, I, and that really disheartens me a lot is that in these threads, somebody drops a little bomb in at some point and the whole thread goes. You know what? Crazy. You are old. <laughs> yeah, no, I no, no, am please, old. Please. We can't deal with it, but younger people can, and they're going back and forth, yeah, and it, it's starting conversations no, too. The, the big difference is these things have a very small half life. Yes, and very true. Gets off their their. salvo of rage, and it's gone, and any kind Would anybody here who's uh, act more active uh, on social media now like to comment on what he said? Like, how do you guys feel about it? Conversations, the threads that you get onto. Hit me hard. I, you know, <laughs> I like the idea that you think about something that somebody has said, and you can't respond immediately, and you have to frame what you want and it sits there for a while. Well, those were the good old days. <laughs> but we have good days to come. It's going to be fine, I think. <laughs> anyway, any rate, it's, uh, an hour is up, and uh, people are slipping out. So if you, one, one. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I was more um, talking about your, your style, um, thinking about that. I, I, my background is, is history and culture and things like that. 
um, popular culture. So I can appreciate your your um, style changing from your your cartoons in the in the in the early '90s to now, and um, just picking up on a lot of uh, a lot of that. It seems to me that, that you adjusted. Um, with the social media and with everything going on, like you can see, like with the different pops of color and and how you are presenting your characters, that you're you're at the forefront. So I wouldn't say you know I'm old or anything like that. <laughs> this is very very good. Well, um, thank you. But uh, at, that as a side, my uh, my next thing is where do you see um, political cartoons and um, with the newspapers facing such a, a, a struggle and print media facing a struggle um, to stay relevant and to stay, stay circulated. Um, and I know you mentioned the one the one website that you're on. Are there other venues where you think that the, the, this kind of thinking and, and this, um, like, you know, political cartoons and just, just talking about anything like that can, can live aside from social media? I mean, social media is the obvious thing, but I mean, where else can people be? Well, uh, Instagram, there are a lot of cartoonists on Instagram, and they follow each other, and you can thread through them. Um, but um, I, I just, when you were talking about that, I just wanted to say one thing about newspapers. The reason I still subscribe to three newspapers a day and read them fairly thoroughly is that good writing spurs images. And um, so I'll read a paper and, and I'll read a phrase and something will come to mind. And with the newspaper, I have my pen and I just do a little drawing like that. It's the first drawing I did of an idea that turned into this cartoon. Um, and I don't have that on, online. Um, I don't read as well online. I, I am already a scatterbrain and not the, the best reader ever. I'm a very slow reader. So to have things popping up all the time online distracts me and I don't pay the, t the attention I need to. And so that's why I like newspaper, old newspapers. But, you know, it's not coming back. And the future... Um, well, the New York Times just said that they made $600 million. I can't believe that. Maybe it was $600,000. I don't know. It's 600 something dollars on web advertising. And that is like this huge leap forward because the big problem with uh, newspapers is that they exist, that they exist by selling big ads like this. And those ads are going to the internet. And finally now, uh, maybe newspapers will get, it, 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 we can't even call them newspapers anymore, because news sources will get some part of the revenue. So that's the future, I hope. But I, I know I'm keeping you guys, so <laughs> if you have questions, uh, please come up and ask. I'll, I'll stick around for a while. But thank you all for coming. You're a great audience.